Uh, welcome, Mark. Thank you for having me, ma'am. Okay, Mark, well, tell me what it's like to be a JOTC instructor and what you did there and how your experience has been trying to get a claim going on. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, the, claims, the claim with anything has been rough. Um, it was a great experience being an instructor there. I, I served with great people. I served under great people. We had great officer. We had great leadership. And uh, it was a great experience to be an instructor there. Um, all the support crew, S1, S2, S3, S4, the boathouse people, the motor pool, um, they, they were all, it was just a great, great bunch of people there at the time I was there. And uh... Uh, you were an instructor out at the JOTC. That was a brutal, uh, they called that green hell for a reason. So tell me about that uh, experience. Well, one of the things I used to tell the rotational battalions or the students was the jungle does not need you here. The jungle can defend itself just fine. It doesn't need anyone to defend it. And um, basically, what our mission was is to adapt infantry tactics, for the most part, um, FM7-8 tactics, to the jungle environment, because it's a lot different than the desert environment or a conventional environment such as uh, the United States. It's the jungle is completely different and um, it calls for different tactics and adjustments in, in that area. Now you were there for four years. Were you out in the jungle the whole time you were there? Well, we were in the jungle. I started out there as the unit armorer, And then when a, uh, a slide opened over at Alpha Company, then I was able to transition over to Alpha Company and become an instructor. And they still didn't let me out of the armorer gig. I still had to be the sergeant in charge of the arms room, but I was an instructor on top of that. Oh, wow. That's a busy, busy job. So were you sleeping in the jungle? Like when you were out there instructing, were you there for the full three weeks? The first, well, it's a three week course. And the first week consists of a lot of, a lot of classroom and some of the classroom is outdoor classroom. Uh, we did things like uh, not tying knots, uh, ropes, things of that nature to construct one rope bridges or two rope bridges and teach them how to cross water obstacles with uh, ropes. We also did improvised flotation devices such as uh, the poncho raft and the rucksack float. So we taught. About, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Tell us about the terrain there. You know, a lot of people don't realize that it's not flat. It's very much not flat. It's very, it's very mountainous, very hilly, and there are a lot of treacherous points in the jungle. A lot of big drop-offs. Uh, not to mention everything you could bump into at night. That's why we didn't move at night or what we tried to train the battalions not to move at night. You've got black palm that's out there and that that's not fun. Uh, plus the drop-offs and the night vision devices that we had at the time, you had no depth, depth, excuse me, depth perception with so you really couldn't tell very, very much or very well how, how close or far something was away from you. So you could walk right off a cliff and, and not even realize it until you, you hit the bottom or wow. whatever you hit on the way down. Now, we train people uh, three weeks on and then would people come from the United States and train there just for the three weeks? Or would they be people that were stationed there in Panama? Who were your customers? Oh, both. We had, uh, 
the 587 infantry would train on occasion the 508 airborne from the pacific side they would train occasionally we uh our customers were generally uh the army and the marines we trained all of the known infantry battalions you know 82nd airborne 101st airborne 10th Mountain Division, 7th Infantry. Back in the day, we had a lot of Marine Force Recon battalions trained there. We had uh, we had our special operations guys that would come down there and train uh, the the SEALs, uh, Delta on a very rare occasion. The Rangers were there a couple times, um, and then we trained other other countries too such as Brazil, Peru, uh, Colombia. So we, uh, it was, we trained a lot. We trained the Gurkhas one time. Okay. Wow. I know we saw a lot of people down there during the 70s with different kinds of hats, you know, like different kinds of berets. Some, a lot of them were special forces, but some seemed to be from different places that I had never seen there their berets or uh, their patches on their uniforms didn't know who they were just knew they were supposed to be there if they're there right well we hoped <clears throat> yeah we but, hoped. <laughs> uh, there there were a lot of units especially at jotc that came through um i i don't know I, i'd like to say we were a pretty premier training area because it was so realistic <laughs> yeah it was and uh, our cadre was was top notch, and we we gave them the best we had to offer, and and it, some of it may have been primitive, but but it was damn good training. I know it was tough. Did you have any casualties while you were training there? Yes, ma'am. On a regular basis, there's we had casualties. Usually in the uh, heat exhaustion category, uh, once on my last rotation there, I, I had a heat stroke that had to be medevaced out by, by helicopter. And we had to resuscitate him several times before the helicopter got there from Fort Clayton. Or maybe it was Howard. I, I forget where the helicopter came out of. <clears throat> We had people that had allergic reactions to bee stings because the uh, killer bee is prevalent down there. Uh, among other things, there were is, there really weren't as many snake bites as you would think. We had an instructor bit by a bushmaster, and he ended up okay. He was he was fine, but. He was medevaced out by the Navy. They had to pick him up on the banks and run him down the Chagras to a landing zone where the medevac helicopter landed. And he went to Gorgas and he ended up being fine, thank God. Uh, we had a student on the land now, of course, that was bit by a Cayman. It's just really a multitude of, of injuries that. That, uh, and how occurred. would you communicate back to wherever to bring help? You know, I mean, we didn't have phone cell phones in those days. Uh, no, ma'am, we didn't. We The units carried the uh, PRC-77 and later on the Singar radio where they would communicate internally within their unit. But as instructors, we carried the Motorola handheld radio and we had repeaters set up on the high ground. So we could hit a repeater and the repeater would send it back to headquarters, uh, our S3 operations department and, and uh, could make things happen. Now, there were some times where we couldn't get single uh, signal, but there were, that went for any radio, whether it was the units radio or our Motorola's. Uh, but to get the bird out and then uh, the helicopters come if you were deep in the jungle how would they land how would they get the person out if we're really deep if we're really in there then we would have to use the jungle penetrator which is a 
uh, it's a, a weighted cable that has seats attached to it that fold down and it basically busts through the canopies and gets to the ground. And if the casualty is ambulatory, then you can pull a seat down and he would sit face first towards the cable and we would just belt him to the to the cable in the weight and he would be hoisted up if he is not ambulatory then we would they would lower a basket and we would strap him in real good to the basket and never been in one but i'm sure it wasn't a fun trip up going back through the canopy but that's all we had wow wow Interesting. Now, what about uh, all the other instructors that you know of? Um, have any of them um, uh, made any claims? Uh, are they injured? I don't know about their claims. I know that I am one of many with heart problems. Um, only, I'm only 55 years old. I had a triple bypass at the age of 52, and the VA could not determine why I had blockages. Um, four other people that I taught with have had triple bypasses. One has had a stroke, but he's okay. Um, and then five others that I served with have, have died of heart disease. Some it was, some it was uh, immediate. An immediate death upon heart attack others it was uh just heart disease taking its toll interesting and they say nothing was there but all these people and that and the, these instructors um uh, about 10 of them you know that um have had heart disease yes ma'am out of a unit of about well jltb was about 120 people but all of the ones that I've that I'm referring to were instructors and a company, the instructor company was about 50 instructors. That and seems so like a high percentage of people with heart disease that were all in the same place. Yes, ma'am. Seems to be. Mm. And how's your family? Was your family there with you? Yes, ma'am. Uh, my family was there. It was an accompanied tour. My daughter was born there. She was born in, uh, at Gorgas, and she was born with scoliosis. And she had a surgery in high school to put a spine in her, or put a uh, a rod in her spine. And she suffers on a daily basis to this day. And did Gorgas have any reason, you know, for the scoliosis? No, ma'am. They said nothing about it. We actually didn't know at the time. They either didn't, I, they didn't diagnose it at the time. Whether or not they knew about it at the time, I don't know. But we found out about it when uh, she was going through her physicals and stuff to get into kindergarten. Interesting. Huh. So, um... Boy, it was paradise where we lived, and we couldn't have lived there without spraying for sure. But uh, it's the travesty of, you know, uh, saying nothing happened when we have all these people that are hurting. Um, and you're not the only one. There's many people out there that have no idea that uh, they were affected by the spraying that went on down there. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It's a sad situation. I, I really wish somebody would take responsibility or maybe not even responsibility, just admit that it was done and make things right. That's pretty much all we're asking. We're not trying to put anybody's head on a platter. We just want to get taken care of. Right. Now, do you go to the VA for medical reasons and are they uh, treating you right? I, I do go to the to the VA and sometimes yes, sometimes no. I, I'm not happy with my doctor and I've already put in a request with the VSO to be able to change doctors because I, I, I don't like her. And 
I really don't think she cares at all. But so is it pretty easy to change doctors to the VA system? Apparently not. I'm, it's been over a year and I still haven't been able to. That's crazy. Now you're 55, so you're too young for Medicare right now, right? Correct. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so you're kind of stuck with the VA at the moment. Huh. Well, I hope that the VA system improves because I hear that uh, some are good. Sometimes they find a good doctor or a good clinic, and sometimes it's just not so good. Correct. And my doctor, my, the first time my fiance went up there with me, my doctor left my fiance with her jaw dropped some of the things she was saying uh, she's just she's refusing to and this has nothing to do with agent orange but my knees are pretty shot which is normal for the infantry and she told me straight up i'm not referring you to ortho because you can still walk <coughs> now can you make so you can't make an appointment to go to an ortho through the VA without the doctor's permission. Is that right? Referral. Correct. Yes, oh. ma'am. Hmm. The drop zone, you know, where the, uh, the 82nd airborne or all the other airborne people would come in and they would drop into, I've heard uh, that that landing zone is like denuded of trees. It, it, there's a lot of trees around it. But the landing zone itself was mostly kuna grass or elephant grass, whatever you want to call it. It's about 12 feet tall, and it's actually pretty sharp when you're walking through it. So on a jump, the soldiers, they really, they have to be cognizant of the fact that what they think is land is not land yet. It's still 12 feet below what they're able to see. And um, helicopter pilots as well. They've got to be, they had to be cognizant of, of that as well because they thought they were landing on solid ground, but they had, you know, 10, 12, 15 more feet to go before they got to solid land. And, and uh, there was one helicopter in particular back when we had the Hueys and he realized too late what was going on and he had already put the bird in in the grass but not all the way to the ground and it had wrapped around his skid and when he tried to pull out of it it tore his his skid off and um and that 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 helicopter stayed there for a little while before it could be recovered i bet i was just gonna ask how they recovered a helicopter uh, well i wasn't a part of that operation but i'm pretty sure it involved a lot of a lot of machetes and I, I really have no idea how they recovered it. I just remember it being there. Yeah. That would be hard to uh, get out of a jungle uh, environment with the hills and the trees and the jungle environment to take a help to extract a helicopter. I would think. Um, well, there were roads going into the LZ. Say that again. There were roads going into the LZ, so it wasn't like it was in the in the thick of the jungle. Oh, good, good. But still, I, I would think that it might be easier just to go in and repair the skid and take off. Then maybe I don't know. And I, I was I wasn't a part of that. I just knew it happened, so I can't make a comment on the decision making process that was involved there. There were some interesting times down there, for sure. Um, yes, ma'am. Yeah. We uh, would catch butterflies, and we would follow your paths that you guys made in the jungle. And, um, you know, caught one of those blue butterflies. And I just read recently that if you see a blue butterfly in person, it gives you power. I'm sure you oh. saw lots of them down there. Saw a lot of a lot of stuff that I didn't even know what it was sometimes. The bugs were so beautiful. The the different colors of the bugs. Uh, we we hatched a butter. Well, it was a moth that we hatched and kept it in a cage at my husband's office. 
So people, new people that came down there, they're like, what the hell is that? And we, we don't know, we're, we're hatching it to see, you know? But uh, the, the colors, the vibrant colors in the jungle are just absolutely fabulous. And I'm really happy that we had that experience to go in the jungle. I, I was just a young girl and followed my husband. He was an explorer and we all we had was the machete and some water and uh, a compass and that was it. And uh, we were just lucky we came out alive. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you thought the bugs were pretty because I didn't. <laughs> they hurt. We live next door to a guy who worked for the Smithsonian. And Smithsonian's down there, you know. And he had, he had his whole house was full of drawers of bugs identified. And so we would hang around with him and, and look at all the beautiful bugs. Um, and some of them are very dangerous. And when we moved on to Davis, we lived in Cologne for nine months. And when we moved on to Port Davis in the front yard, there was something very colorful on the lawn. And I bent down to see what it was. And my husband said, that, that's a coral snake. And I'm like, uh, is that a bad snake? And he said, that's a very bad snake. And luckily it was dead. I don't know what killed it on my front lawn, but it was dead. Did you uh, run into any snakes? uh like coral snakes or the banana viper one time i was trying to get some bananas and there was a little green snake that came out of the bananas i hear that's a bad snake too i i think that snake we never called it that i've never heard that terminology before but i think the snake you're referring to would be the eyelash viper it had i like they look like eyelashes over its lid over its eyelids and they're pretty dangerous but what uh, their their venom isn't that extraordinary. I mean, you're going to have a bad day, but what makes it dangerous is the fact that it does it does hang out in the trees. So most of the bites, and I never even saw a bite from an eyelash wiper, but most of the bites are uh, the head and neck area. So the venom circulates through your body pretty quickly. And that, that's what makes that dangerous. A, a coral snake, you know, they're, they're native to the United States as well. Really? But as, oh, yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Oh, I did not know. Oh, they sure are. But they're, they're very reclusive. And you've really got to be messing with them to get a, uh, a venomous bite from them because their fangs are in the back of their jaws. They are not in the front. But they do a lot of... They're in holes a lot. And so you, you've got to be sticking your hand someplace where you shouldn't be sticking it. <laughs> and most of the coral snake bites are usually like on the web of the, uh, the web of your hand in between the... Uh, your thumb and forefinger. Oh. We, uh, of course, you know, we had the Bushmaster and the Fertilance also in, in Panama. Um, I saw very, very few Bushmasters. And I saw quite a few Fertilances. Um, the instructor getting bit by that Bushmaster, that, that's the only Bushmaster bite that I saw. And I, from what I understand, a lot of the fatalities from digging the Panama Canal came from not only malaria, but also the uh, Fertilance strike. But I, I really never saw anyone or heard of anyone getting hit by a Fertilance. I saw them all the time. Maybe not all the time. I saw them frequently. I never saw anybody get bitten by them. The monkeys, you know, they were super loud. You know, we had some monkeys following us when we were in the jungle. They did not like us in the jungle at all. Now, did they bother you guys out in the jungle? They're so loud. Did they bother you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you were telling me before about what they like to do, and so we were happy they didn't do that to us. Well, they were dead. The, the monkeys are deafening and and they're so curious but then they they'll they will 
poop in their hands and throw it at you. What? They will they will poop in their hands and throw it at you. Oh my gosh. I'm glad they didn't do that to us. <laughs> oh, me too. The uh, but they're deafening when you're trying to bed down at sunset. And the parrots are too. The parrots are absolutely annoying and deafening. This, I was never in the jungle at night. At night, is it as noisy as it is during the day? In a subtle way, it's different. Different sounds, different nocturnal animals are coming out. So it, it, it's still, it's still, a, I won't say noisy, but it's different, different sounds from different animals than you would hear or see during the daytime hours. So the monkeys sleep at night? They don't make so much noise? No, not so much. Yeah, they're... Maybe because they can't see you so much, you know. I mean, they, they saw us uh, running through their jungle, uh, and they did not like it. <laughs> no, ma'am. They don't. Uh, I don't know if they don't like it or if they're just curious. I just, yeah. I don't know. I just want her to leave me alone. Right, no right. I told my husband, what do we do? What do we do? And he just said, just keep walking. You know, so we did. We just kept walking, and they missed throwing their poop at us because we didn't get hit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, brother. It was a real interesting, beautiful place, and I'm glad that we had that experience, but the chemical exposure is uh, is an issue for a lot of people. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, it appears to be. I mean, I'm not, I'm not your smoking gun on that issue because I never even knew about it while I was there, and the only reason I know about it now is because of you. And putting two and two together with my health problems and my uh, fellow soldiers' health problems. And it seems to be a common denominator that you've uncovered. Right. And, you know, a lot of people still don't know about it. And that's why um, I made this patch behind me so that hopefully uh, we can spread the word to others who uh, know that there's a reason that they're sick. Um, I don't know if we'll get our bill through Congress or not. I don't know if they're going to help us or not, but um, we do hope so. And so we just continue marching forward. I did put on my website, agentorangeinpanama.com, the registry. It's an unofficial registry because the VA won't do it until uh, Panama makes the list. And Panama has not made the list yet. That's what we're trying to work on with the bill. But if people want to register their diseases for civilians and for military, um, go to the website and, uh, you know, put in your diseases. In case the Congress ever wants to know how many people are injured, we might have a starting point for them to contact these people. So that's what it's for. Yes, ma'am. I, you know, I, I wrote my representative about it and I got a, a form letter back that started out with, Hey friend, good to hear from you and all this other crap. But he did not, he did not address the issues specifically or say he would support it or be against it. In several years, I don't know how many years I've seen uh, letters back from representatives because a lot of veterans share them with me. And uh, one this week was the first one that mentioned Panama. Oh, wow. Thank you about your concerns about Panama veterans. I was shocked because that's the first time because all the letters are form letters, uh, how much they do for veterans, but never ever about our cause. And right. how Panama needs help. Correct. Yes, ma'am. That's pretty much what I got. I'll, I'll send you a copy of it if you'd like, but it's, it, you don't need to, um, you can just you text me and let me know you got one from representative so-and-so and, you know, stay on them and try to get them to support our bill because the facts are historical facts. I mean, it's really hard to dispute, um, but they are. So we just all need to, you know, carry, go forward and know that you're not going to win uh, the first round at the regional level. You're going to be denied. 
Yes, and so then go to the appeal and DABs are supposed to be able to help you uh, with a free appeal, although DABs don't understand about Panama. So you need to educate them, you know, and uh, educate yourselves so that you can talk about it to them. Keep your claims simple, you know, their form, your diseases, get a doctor's note if you can about your disease and how it could have been caused by these uh, chemicals that were found there. And um, a nexus letter, you know, from the doctor, that's what that's called, it's connection, you know, that in his, prof his or her professional opinion, it's more likely than not could have been caused by these chemicals that you were exposed to. Because <laughs> the your diseases are already, the heart disease is already connected to those chemicals by the VA. The problem is Panama is not connected. So they don't believe us. Uh, we give them the historical documents and have given them many times to them and they just uh, ignore it. But people have one. And I just posted on my Facebook page a, a person that won for heart disease. And uh, the compelling evidence that he gave them was the shipments, the U.S. Commerce records. Oh, uh, wow. Now, in your case, you were there in the 90s. And so I do have some shipment records to post uh, about growth regulators. Uh, that is the same item as far as I'm concerned, because that's what it was called. Also, growth regulators. It regulated the growth of plants. Um, the the uh, number is the same on the shipping records. The nomenclature is different. It's instead of 24D and 245T after 1977, they called it growth regulators. Um, the CFR says that's the same stuff. I don't know because they won't tell us, you know, what they shipped. I've done a FOIA to the DOD and they just don't tell us. So uh, <clears throat> that connection's already been made, your heart disease, to those chemicals and use the shipment records. Uh, the dioxin lasts in the soil up to 100 years. That's what Dr. Dornchuk and other, uh, Dr. Pasternak, who wrote that report. And that's in my, a reference in my book. And it's also on my website and my blogs about it lasting up to 100 years. Dr. Dornchuk's CV is there as well as his statement. Um, so I don't get it, you know, why Panama is being ignored but I hope that this channel and more people coming forward to tell their stories about what they're suffering, how they're suffering, uh, can help with that. Push. Yes, ma'am. It would be nice. It would be. So you, uh, do you have a claim in now, Mark? Not at the moment, no, ma'am. But I'm... Have you had one before or no? Not for Agent Orange. Okay, so when you do put it in, don't use the word Agent Orange. Um, the government thinks there's some difference between Agent Orange and 24D and 245T. There is not, according to their historical records. But since that's how they feel, uh, just use those chemicals, 24D and 245T, and all the other chemicals that we found, because now the PACT Act, you know, involves a lot of different chemicals that people were exposed to. We were also exposed to those, DDT, uh, in the numerous other chemicals, lindane, I, I can't even remember, but I listed all of them in my blogs and in my book. So we should be helped, and we're hoping that we get help someday. Yes, ma'am, I hope so. I'm praying so I could use it. We all, a lot of us could use it. You, my daughter, soldiers, we could all use the help and just the accountability and doing the right thing by our government would be nice. Okay, now did you wanna wrap up and say anything to, uh, else, Mark? Just like to give a shout out to American Legion Post 50 in Cleburne. Okay, is that where you belong? Yes, ma'am, I'm the Sergeant at Arms. Oh, good, good, well spread the word there and- I uh, will about Panama and if they need any information, you know, you know, you know where to find it and get your claim in, you know, keep it simple because you will be denied and then appeal, appeal it and you can add to it, you know, as you go along. So. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Get it done. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I will. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show and letting people know, you know, that you are also suffering and that, you know, other instructors, from JOTC or also have heart disease. 
I mean, something happened down there. We know that. Yes, ma'am. That's that's true. All right. Well, thanks. Well, I a appreciate lot. you having us on. I appreciate everything you're doing for our cause. Well, thanks. I you know I thought it would be a slam dunk, easy easy peasy. <laughs> hmm. We're fighting uh, the government, so we need to keep on keep on telling them what happened so that we can get some help. Yes, ma'am.